Welcome to the Glassworking Shop. In today's video, I'm continuing development of my chip stack assembly kiln apparatus. And I've added a couple of things and changed a couple of things. In the previous design, I had a, an insulating block down here to try to prevent heat loss from the plate. And that really didn't work very well, so now I've rejiggered the thing around and modified some stuff and welded up some stuff, and now I have a Bunsen under the plate, which hopefully will keep a little bit of the heat loss under control and possibly make the thing recover temperature a little bit faster when I stick it back in. So, just looking here, Looks like I'm just about up to temperature, just about ready to get started. I'm using the Mirage hand torch. Oh, there we go. And... going to also, well not at the moment, I was also planning on using the, the micro torch, but for this first step in the operation it probably isn't going to be what I'm going to want. So just to review what's going on here in the couple of minutes as it gets up to temperature, this is an experiment that I'm working on trying to adapt the classic Italian technique of Pastorelli work to small-scale Boro work. And my glasses are fogging up a little bit. It's cold here in the glassworking shop in Northern California in the winter. So trying to adapt the Pastorelli technique from soft glass to working with Boro chip stack assembly. I realized that most guys, or the way I was taught, is to do it in basically in thin air with tweezers and assemble the pieces on a punty or on a tube. And I never had really good luck with it, and I think this is worth exploring. Of course, you know, uh, like all R&D and like all experiments, it might turn out that at the end of the exploration, I determine, yep, that didn't work very well, but so far I'm getting pretty decent results. So, I'm going to get my plate out here and get to work. The challenge that I'm facing is to try to get the chips to stick together and not stick to the plate. And this is the biggest difficulty that I face is trying to balance the heat so that I can get them hot enough to stick together, but not so hot that they stick to my plate. And this has turned out to be a more difficult balance than I originally thought. So I'm using very gentle heat using a kind of a softish flame, keeping the torch far away from the surface to try to gently and uniformly heat the chips and probably should get my Bunsen going here. I'm 
try to get that plate maintaining its temperature. Of course, when I'm talking and working at the same time, it's hard to pay attention to my work when I'm concentrating on my narration and hard to concentrate on my narration when I'm thinking about my work. These chips that I made were resized after pulling in the squeezer and they're very accurate. I didn't cold work them to try to make the uh, the alignment absolutely perfect so there is a little bit of misalignment but I'm still debating on how much perfect alignment is necessary, how much I can correct in the fusing operation. Still very much a work in progress. Now what I'm trying to do here is very, very, very carefully heat the chips to fusing temperature and avoid sticking to the plate and also avoid boiling the surface. I've got a lot of color in these patterns. Okay, now there I had a little bit of sticking, but I was able to successfully get it unstuck. When these things stick to the plate really bad, it's a catastrophic failure that results in the loss of the chip and sometimes the loss of the plate. And, of course, just about my least favorite thing in all of engineering is catastrophic unrecoverable failure. I'm using a, a special graphite paddle that I designed and built that has a steel reinforcement so that I can apply significant downward pressure. A, well, this is actually sticking more than I would have liked, but hey, that's all part of the balance. So I'm using this specially designed graphite paddle that can apply significant downward pressure. A regular graphite paddle made with just regular design uh, process would almost certainly break and fail if I tried doing this operation because I'm applying a significant amount of downward pressure. I'm also, you notice that I have a, a steel backstop here on my rig. I'm also applying pressure to squeeze the chips together, which is not a large amount of pressure. It actually is a very, very gentle amount of pressure because during this operation the chips get very soft and developing a feel for this is a very important part of mastering this process. Now I'm trying as hard as I can to avoid overheating the surface and causing bubbles in the color. I'm using, there's a lot of sensitive colors that are very easy to boil in these chips. And I'm being very, very careful to avoid overheating the surface. I'm also working on trying to close up some of the voids and the bubbles that are present in the chips themselves. 
um, even though I'm working on improving my technique overall to avoid boiling glass when I make the chips, when I looked at the chips under the microscope, it was pretty obvious that there was a few little bubbles. Bubbles are kind of like the curse of this process that I'm trying as hard as I can to avoid. And when they happen, I'm trying as hard as I can to fill them, squeeze them together. But of course, it's, there's always a chance that attempting to fix one bubble will result in making five more. So it's all about balance. And this process has turned out to be a very, very delicate balance. So I've been going back and forth between two different methods and trying to figure out which method is correct. One method is concentrate on the areas that need to be fused using a small flame. And the other approach is uniformly heat the entire piece using a large soft flame. And I think I'm having better luck with the uniform heating that trying to apply the kind of focused flame to the areas that need fusing seems to result in a, a little bit more distortion of the pattern. And using the larger, softer flame seems to result in less distortion and kind of seems to get the fusing and close up the gaps just about as fast. So once again, everything I'm doing here is all a work in progress. It's all R&D. I've never been taught this method. I'm kind of making it up as I go. And i got to remember to turn the Bunsen off before closing the, or before moving the, huh, hard to talk and think at the same time. So, while I'm waiting for this to recover down to 1540, 1530, it'll probably stabilize around 1500. I'm going to talk a little bit about time, temperature, balance, substrates, and the whole philosophy of what I'm doing. Um, when I started this, like I said, I've, I've never been taught how to do this. I'm just trying things. And, you know, sometimes I try stupid things. Sometimes I try things that don't work. Sometimes I try things that more experienced people would read about or hear about and say, well, why'd you do that, dude? That's not going to work. Um, I don't know. I just try things. I'm an inventor. So the first thing I tried was doing it on a steel plate preheating the chips in a regular annealing kiln and then working with a hand torch, uh, of course keeping the steel plate off my bench so I didn't destroy my bench. And that kind of worked, but the mild steel developed a scale, as any blacksmith knows, and uh, you know that didn't work very well. I only tried that once. Then I switched to a stainless plate and avoided the scale problem, but uh, the chip stuck to the plate, the plate got red hot, the plate warped. Um, then I started trying graphite. 
once again using the annealing kiln, taking the piece out of the annealing kiln, putting it on a support, and using the hand torch. And I achieved some fairly decent success with that method. Uh, some of my nicer looking pieces were assembled using the hand torch on a graphite plate where the graphite plate was, you know, once it was out of the kiln, it was getting colder and colder and colder as I worked. What I did notice was it was kind of hard to get the chips up to the temperature I wanted um, without overheating the surface and causing bubbles and boiling and scuzzing. So then I came up with this idea of well, what if I worked at higher temperature on a higher temperature plate? Because, you know, graphite, uh, it, even though you can heat it up to 3,000 degrees in a vacuum, in air, it starts burning if you get it too hot. So I came up with this apparatus using a Paragon Caldera uh, ceramic kiln. And got to make sure that I'm not overheating here. Um, the first thing that I tried was a regular ceramic kiln shelf and not knowing anything I turned the kiln up all the way, put a chip on it and sure enough it melted and stuck. It stuck like glue. No way to remove the chip. So then I st started experimenting with a couple of things with using different temperature and with using kiln wash. Well, the kiln wash worked. It prevented sticking but it also kind of turned to sand and the sand got stuck in the glass and some of it got stuck quite deeply and resulted in a lot of cold work and a lot of problems. So I started experimenting with ceramics. Um, I looked at, uh, first of all, I just observed that the ceramic business is a rather difficult business to deal with because almost all websites from ceramic companies don't really offer a shopping cart or products in stock. They always say, contact our engineering staff for a quote on your custom project. And of course, I know that's code for, I can't afford it. So I did manage to find some ceramic plate in stock at McMaster Car. Um, very expensive, you know, McMaster is not the low cost option. And I tried that, seemed to work pretty well. 99% alumina, high temperature, what they call ultra machinable ceramic. And then I found a couple of other, what claimed to be the same thing, 99% alumina ceramic. Uh, one of them was Chinese, uh, sold on eBay, but shipped from China. And another one was from um, an American company. And the one thing that I noticed when I got these plates in stock the plate from, even though they were all claimed to be 99% uh, alumina, ceramic, uh, high temperature, but they really looked and felt different. The Chinese one was hard as a dinner plate. My wet saw just about couldn't cut it. My wet saw struggled. And uh, when I tried using it, it was uh, very smooth, very hard put it in the kiln, preheated it to 1500 degrees. First time I tried using it, it exploded. Same thing with the, uh, with the other plate that I got from the US supplier. It looked hard, it looked stiff, it looked smooth, and it had no tolerance to heat shock at all. The McMaster plate was softer. It was actually marketed as ultra machinable and it feels soft. It feels so soft you can scratch it with a fingernail. I can sand it with sandpaper. And what I've learned from this is the super, super hard ceramics are totally intolerant of thermal shock. Heat them uniformly, they'll work all day. Heat them non-uniformly with a torch on a spot, they explode. So, so far the McMaster plate is the go-to plate working extremely well for this application. I'm noticing a little bit of surface cracking, but so far the structural integrity is still pretty good. Um, unfortunately, you know, the price is rather high and I'm going to be continuing my exploration trying to find suitable plates at more reasonable prices, but uh, 
so far the, the ceramic plate from McMaster seems to work. I did try another option. Um, one of the uh, people on, uh, on Facebook suggested that I put a coating, an anti-oxidation coating over a graphite plate that would prevent the graphite from burning. And I did that, and yes, it does prevent the graphite from burning, but graphite, uh, two things. First of all, the chip sticks to the anti, uh, the chip won't stick to graphite, but the chips do stick to the uh, anti-oxidation coating. And second of all, graphite is an excellent conductor of heat, and I noticed that my chips were more difficult to heat to working temperature and that my plate was losing heat faster. So at the moment at least, um, it appears that the, uh, the ceramic plate is the best choice. I did try, there's a uh, boron nitride mold release coating that uh, claims to be an anti-stick coating. I did try spraying my plate with that, but it flaked off, it got stuck in the glass, it made a mess. Didn't really do me much good. I'm, I have contacted a ceramic supplier and am in the process of trying to uh, source some boron nitride solid ceramic plates. I suspect it's an exotic material. I suspect it won't be cheap. But anyway, I haven't received a quote yet because of the holiday madness. And hopefully, uh, fairly soon now, I'll be able to determine if the boron nitride plate is a viable option. But uh, at the moment, this is the plate that I'm using. So the kiln has recovered its temperature. And I'm going to go back for the second side fusing. sticking. Surface looks beautiful. Almost completely fused. This is the bottom surface. Actually looks amazingly good. I'm thinking that, the, uh, that this method of gentle uniform heat is going to be a better method for me than trying to concentrate the heat on the parts that need to be fused. The pattern is looking really good. I'm getting a bit of, my flame is kind of jumping around a little bit. Let me see if I can adjust that a little bit more. I think the radiant heat coming off the plate may be affecting my flame, causing it to jump around a little more than I'd like. Overall, things are looking very, very good. not sticking. I'm making my chips almost a quarter of an inch thick. Pretty, pretty close to a quarter of an inch, like 230, 240 thousandths, so that I have a little bit of working room to be able to grind away when I'm cold working, to be able to grind away a little bit of the the surface degradation caused by the fusing process. Trying to get my 
target my finished piece about 150, 150 thousandths. Of course, it's always a trade-off. I think that thicker chips might behave a little better. They might retain a little more heat and possibly behave a little better, but then I get less yield out of each pull that I make. So I'm trying to balance getting a, a decent yield of final results versus getting enough thickness to be able to, to successfully do some cold working. Once again, I'm doing a substantial amount of downward pressure. which, of course, I have to be careful because the downward pressure causes the pattern to expand and thin. And so I'm trying to push on the edges toward the center to keep it from growing too big and maintain its squareness. And of course, I can feel how soft it is. As I'm working with it, it is very, very soft. And I've got to be oh so careful when pushing on the edges to avoid major distortion and avoid getting the thing totally out of square. But it's looking really, really good. I think this is going to be one of my more successful pieces. So far I've made, I don't know, six or seven pieces using this apparatus. And I believe it's worth continuing. I believe I'm making progress. Just uniform heat over the entire surface using a soft flame, being very careful to look for signs of boiling. Because bubbles are my nemesis. Every piece I've ever made has had some small bubbles in it. Of course, that being said, they all look really good, and most of the bubbles you can't see unless you magnify, unless you look on the microscope. If you just look at the piece with a, a normal eyeball, they look great. But it's all about R&D, it's all about constant improvement and just asking myself the question, is it possible to make a bubble-free piece? Haven't done it yet, but... Okay. So... Boy, that radiant heat coming off that plate is really something. Flip it over for the next operation. So things are looking really, really good. I think this method is proving to be a great success. I'm going to say a little bit about the spudger tool. I made this little tool that I call a spudger. I don't know where I got that word. I think 
uh, iPhone repair guys use that word. But anyway, it's a little graphite end with a little variety of different rounded shapes on it. And when I started doing the chip fusing process and I was applying heat to the edges that needed to be fused, I was very gently applying a small amount of force right at the edges to try to get them because when you have two chips, two uh, boro glass chips, and you have them together and they look like they're pretty close together, when you apply heat, they start rounding off. And so instead of sticking together, you get like two rounded areas like that. And when I first started doing this, I tried gently touching the rounded surfaces to kind of coerce them together. And it worked, I had success with it, but I, I also thought that the localized application of force might be giving a little bit more distortion than I'd like. So in today's work, I'm not using the spudger at all, just strictly using the flat paddle and heating the entire surface as uniformly as I can possibly heat it, get the surface as hot as I can get it without boiling, and then give significant downward pressure and very gentle sideways pressure to try to kind of like coerce the thing into the shape that I want without introducing local heating or local pressure. Because the last chip that I did, I noticed that in the center of the chip pattern, I was getting a little bit of distortion because I used the spudger to kind of like uh, get the, the center parts where the, where the center was a little bit open because the corners weren't perfectly sharp. I tried kind of like gently pushing them in together and got a little more distortion of the pattern than I would have liked. So. I'm getting very good recovery here on my temperature. The, using the Bunsen under the plate has turned out to be a really excellent strategy. Works a lot better than the insulator. Early in the process, I believe that the, the little Paragon kiln was grossly underpowered and I was thinking about maybe replacing it or redesigning it or modifying it but now with the Bunsen the way it's recovering that may not be a problem so here we go got the chips out Bunsen on. No sticking. Everything is looking very, very good. The surface is looking excellent. The voids are pretty much all filled. I'm thinking that this method is the best method that I've come up with yet. And this assembly is coming out better than any of the ones I've done before. So progress is good.
once again, gentle uniform heating. G very gentle sideways pressure. Fairly intense downward pressure. Constantly looking, being very, very careful, looking for signs of boiling or surface degradation. Trying to keep the torch flame off the ceramic plate because even though this plate is fairly resistant to thermal shock, it still is suffering a little bit of degradation. I'm seeing some small surface cracking. Overall, the result is coming out really, really good. This is probably going to be the best one yet. Okay, one more flip, one more surface. Now, my little handle is kind of getting hot because the entire fixture here is getting hot. Probably going to have to put a, a longer handle or a wooden handle or something like that. In previous videos, for anybody that watched my previous video, I tried a variety of techniques. The, uh, let me go back a step here. Uh, the outer edges, where the chips meet at the outer edges, there's always going to be a little bit of a divot because the corners aren't 100% sharp. And trying to fill up that little divot has always been a challenge. In previous attempts, um, the first time I tried it, I just tried hitting with the flame right on the edge. And of course, that was applying way too much flame to my substrate, to my ceramic piece, causing some, de causing some degradation of the ceramic. Uh, then I switched to putting the, the, the final assembly on a punty, taking it over under a Bunsen, and trying to fuse that end together using a micro torch. And yeah, that worked, but it's some extra work, and then I have to grind off the punty. So what I'm doing today, when I made the chips, I added a kind of what I call a sacrificial black layer on the outer edges of the chips that is not part of the design. So when I cold work the final result, I can cold work out that little divot that uh, where the chips incompletely fuse at the corners, I can cold work out that little divot and still have a nice precise square with nice precise sharp edges. So as I'm, oh, this is actually recovering extremely well. As I'm waiting for the last recovery here, another word about philosophy. Um, as I've been posting on social media, the, the results of this experiment. Um, one guy said, dude, why are you over engineering it? Why don't you just do it the way everybody else does it? Well, because I'm an engineer. 
I'm an inventor. It's my nature. That's what I do. Uh, I approach this whole uh, endeavor of glasswork as an adventure. And what can I invent? What can I come up with? I've never seen a video or read an article where an expert shows how this process is done. Who knows? Maybe that's because the guys who have mastered it want to keep it secret, or maybe it's just a stupid idea. I don't know, but it's fascinating to work on it. It's fascinating to work on it on my own and just try to figure stuff out um, because that's what I do. I'm an R&D engineer. I'm used to it. I'm comfortable figuring out stuff on my own. Also, there's a thing about inventing and inventors that sometimes you know, trying everything you can think of, even the stupid ideas. Sometimes watching a stupid idea catastrophically fails, something happens in the mind of the inventor. That sometimes the good idea appears in the process of watching the bad idea catastrophically fail. Of course, I shouldn't be using the word catastrophic failure because this is actually coming out pretty good and I'm actually having pretty good success and what I'm doing now is just trying to get that one extra little tweak just get it a little bit more perfect a little bit more bubble free a little bit less distortion but overall the process seems to be working really well so I think I'm just about ready for the final operation before it goes into the kiln. Of course, if anybody out there in YouTube land has mastered this and knows exactly what I'm doing wrong, please let me know. Educate me. But one thing that I have found when I ask for help on social media, people who have never tried it just guess. And I know they're trying to be helpful and they're doing their best and their guess is, you know, sometimes a fairly educated guess. But haven't run into anybody yet who says, yes, I do this all the time, I know exactly how to do it right, and I'm willing to share with you. Haven't found that yet. So. I need to do something about that handle. This is looking really, really good. Without a doubt, this is the best one yet. I think I actually managed to close up a lot of the little voids and air bubbles that were present in the chips. The, cor the, the edges are looking excellent. The piece is still square. All is well. Of course, I'm just squaring it up by eye. Fortunately, I got a pretty good eye after years and years of making stuff. Kind of develop a pretty good eye for square and dimensional and
call that one macaroni. I'm going to preheat my tongs. I don't want to shock the thing and have it crack apart on the way to the kiln. So there we have it. <clears throat> very successful day, very successful result, or at least it appears to be looking at it in the hot state. It's kind of hard. Sometimes they look really <clears throat> sometimes they look really good when they're hot, and then I take them out and cold work them and I realize, oh, it's still got a bubble. Oh, it's still got oh, there's another bubble. So anyway. That's it for today's glasswork. Thank you for watching. It's been fun.